Okay, um, we're going to continue our discussion of anti-differentiation. Uh, let's start off by looking at the rules. These are the rules you should know. I'm not going to talk about all these, we don't have time, but let me just highlight a few. Uh, we're assuming that big F and big G are the antiderivatives of little f and little g on some interval i, and that k and c are any real number. Here's the one that's probably the most useful, you'd agree, I think. The most general antiderivative of x to the n as long as n doesn't equal negative 1, you add 1 to the exponent and divide by the new exponent plus c. Now the most general antiderivative of 1 over x is not natural log of x plus c because you have to account for the fact that x to be negative, right? So you get this, um, natural log absolute value of x plus c. It's a little more subtle than that actually. Technically you have two intervals here, x to be greater than 0 or less than 0, and this constant could be different on both those intervals, but it's, it's not a big deal. It really isn't. Um, the most general antiderivative of a to the x would be 1 over ln of a times a to the x plus c. These are all your trig differentiation rules in reverse, right? And these last two, you should know these two. The most general antiderivative of 1 over 1, 1 plus x squared is inverse tangent of x plus c. The most general antiderivative of 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared is inverse sine of x plus c. Okay, so know, it, know all those rules. Okay, next thing. Let's answer the question, when would you use anti-differentiation? The answer to that question is, whenever you know, whenever you're given the rate at which something's changing and you want to go from the rate at which something's changing to the amount of stuff present, see? Suppose you have this tank of water. At midnight, t equals zero, you have 100 cubic meters. And the rate at which the volume's changing is given by 5 minus t squared. The question is, how much water is there at t equals 3, 3 a.m.? So if a of t is the amount of water in the tank after t hours, they're giving you a prime. You got that? This, so this, is, this is the rate at which a is changing. So this would be a, a prime of t. So guess what? You use anti-differentiation to go from the derivative to the function. And you can use the initial condition that the initial amount, a of 0 is 100. So you can find c. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do this problem. So then you got the function now. The amount of water present after t hours is, is this plug in 3, because they will ask you how much is there at 3 a.m. When you plug in 3, you get 106 cubic meters. Nice. Here's another one that I know you've seen this before, or something like it. In your pre-calculus class, you, you would have seen a problem like this, where they, they tell you that a ball is thrown directly in the air, the initial velocity is 96 feet per second, initial height is 16 feet, fine when it hits the ground. Uh, only in your pre-calculus class, they would give you the formula for the height, s of t. In this case, we're going to derive the uh, equation for the height above the ground. From physics, you know that the acceleration on that ball is negative g, where g is, is from gravity. In this case, since we're in the English system, g would be 32 feet per second squared. So what we're going to do is use anti-differentiation twice to solve this equation for s of t. You use it once, take the antiderivative. The antiderivative of a is v of t, which is s prime. You get negative gt plus some constant. And since you're given the initial velocity is 96, you plug in 0 for t, and you get c1 is 96 feet per second. All right. Now you can do it again. Now you can go from v of t to s of t by using anti-differentiation again. You get this. And you get a, a different constant. And you can, you can find that constant by using the fact that the initial, um, initial height is 16 feet. So plug in 0 for t, you get c2 equals 16. And let's also plug in that g is 32 feet per second squared. So you end up with what you were looking for. You have the actual function that gives you the height of the ball above the ground. So remember the question is, when does it hit the ground? So all you have to do is, is set, the, um, set the height equal to 0 and solve this quadratic equation for t. Uh, when I did that, I got that um, t is about 6.2 seconds. Nice, isn't it? Okay, let's keep on going here. This, um, this, this last topic, I think you might like this. We're given the derivative graph. We're given the derivative of f of x, and I want to find f of x. So in other words, I, I want to graph the antiderivative of this function here. Now notice, this is an easy one because f of x um, equals 2, f prime of x equals 2. What would f of x be? Well, f of x would be 2x plus c, right? But, you, but you're also going to be given, in all these problems, unless stated otherwise, we're, we're going to assume that f of 0 is 0. So there's infinitely many functions whose derivative is 2, 
but there's only one that goes through zero zero. So the so the the the, the answer to this one would be. Um, does everyone agree? This is what the graph of the derivative of, of the actual function would be, f of x. It, it has slope 2 and it goes through 0, 0. Okay, before we go on, let me, let me highlight some, some important facts from Math 151 you need to know. This is from section 4.3. Wherever f prime is greater than 0, f has to be increasing. So look, f prime on this next one, number 4, is greater than 0 as long as x is greater than negative 1. So that means f has to be in increasing when x is greater than negative 1. Whenever f prime is less than 0, f has to be de decreasing. So if, if the derivative is um, negative here, that means f has to be de decreasing. In other words, you have a local min here, right? You have a local min at negative 1. Anyway, uh, furthermore, um, look at number 2. Wherever f prime is increasing, f is concave up. Wherever f prime is decreasing, f is concave down. So if f prime goes from increasing to decreasing, that would be a local max of f prime, you'd have to have an inflection point of f, and that's what this says. The local extrema of f prime are the inflection points of f, or at least they occur at the inflection points of f, right? Anyway, if this seems hazy to you, you might want to go back over section 4.3. Alright, so what would the graph, uh, given that information, my, my function goes through 0, 0, and has a local min here, what would the graph of f of x b, if this is a derivative function, wouldn't it look kind of like that? Wouldn't that be the answer to the number 2? Alright, let, let's do some more. Let me, uh, uh that's actually was number 4. Let's look at number 5. See if, see if you can hit the pause button and, and sketch the graph of the, of the actual function. I'm giving you the derivative. I want you to sketch the graph of f of x. Um, we're assuming that f of x goes through 0, 0 and has this for the derivative graph. hit the pause button. Okay, so you should have gotten this because look, f prime goes from positive to negative, so f, so f has to have a local max there. F, um, f prime goes from negative to positive, so f has to, has to have a local min there. Furthermore, notice f prime has a local min at 2, so f has to have an inflection point there. See how it works? Alright, let's keep on going here. You're doing great. Try this one. Try number 6. Hit the pause button. See if you can um, see if you can sketch the graph of f. We're assuming f goes through zero zero and has this as its derivative. Okay, I got this for number six. Uh, notice um, f has uh, goes f prime goes from negative to positive, so f has to have a local min. F prime goes from positive to negative, has to, f has to have a local max. F prime goes from negative to positive, f has to have a local min. Furthermore. F has a local max, you've got to have an inflection point. I should say F prime has a local max, so F has to have an inflection point. F prime has a local min, F prime F has to have an inflection point. Whenever F prime has a local min, F has to have an inflection point, right? Good. Okay, I got time for a couple more, I think. Uh, let's see here. How about how about I got time for two more, I think. Try this one. See if you can number seven. See if you can um, sketch the graph of F. We're assuming f goes through 0, 0 and has this as its graph. Okay, I got this. Notice f has to go through 0, 0. f prime is negative, so f has to be decreasing. f prime is positive, f has to be increasing. It looks like this is 2, this is negative 2, so I get like an absolute value variation on this. All right, let's do let's do one more. This is kind of an in, interesting one. Look at this last one. Now I'm I'm going to assume f of one is zero, not f of zero is zero, because uh, it's obviously not defined at zero. So um, let's uh, let's uh, this is the graph of f prime, and I want you to assume that f of one equals zero, and and what would the graph of f be? Okay, this looks like 1 over x, doesn't it? So, sure enough, when you look at the graph of f, you, you, should, you get this function here. This, uh, uh, f looks kind of like this, which is exactly the, out, the log of the absolute value of x, which is what we talked about. All right, we've got to go. Bye-bye.